Hey everybody, today I am talking about the top 10 games that have never let me down. So these are games that I've introduced to loads of different types of players and they've always gone, gone down extremely well. They've never fallen flat and they've always left the kind of group wanting more and wanting to get more involved in the hobby. So most of these games are towards the lighter end of the scale because naturally if you're introducing games to, to newbies then they're not going to be extremely heavy complicated games. So they're all pretty simple or on that partier style of thing. So mainly filler games and, um, and party style games but nonetheless um, great fun and always got done extremely well. So let's get started at number 10. So at number 10 I have, I suppose it's almost like a party plus style game. This one is QE. Now this one is a, a bidding style game as everybody takes control of these different countries or different nations and you are bidding on all these different industries. But the cool thing about this game is that you can bid whatever you want in order to collect these different um, companies and you're trying to collect these companies to get lots of different set collection bonuses. So you can bid as little as you know ten pounds, or as much as a hundred million pounds, or you know, infinite, infinitely high. No matter how high you want to go, you can bid. But the twist is, no matter whoever bids the most money at the end of the game is automatically disqualified from winning. Now this is quite a novel concept, and initially people might think, oh, this this is just going to go way off the rails. But it actually. The economy is completely managed and kind of self-sustained by all the players and what they're bidding because you don't, you never want to be the one who's bidding the most. And another twist on this game is that every round, one person is going to know what everybody's bidding. Um, so you've also got like a, a little bit of hidden information and you can use that to your advantage. And just that, that murkiness of how much are people bidding and how much have I got to play with is just where the fun really comes in. It adds a great tension. It's light, but it still has some really crunchy decisions. It plays in about half an hour and it just always leaves uh, the room in a great uh, a great frame of mind and just causes a lot of fun. And um, naturally, you always want to play this game uh, back to back because it is that much fun. Uh, at number nine, I have uh, a party game with wits and wages. Now, I think about this game is that it's a bit of a throwback to those kind of trivia games. This one, you are actually bidding um, or putting down a guesstimate on a question that you're probably not going to know the answer to. You know, the very uh, difficult to know number based questions, you know, such as how tall the meters is the Eiffel Tower or something like that. So you can take an educated guess. But the trick about the cool thing about this one is that no matter when everybody's bid their um put their numbers down and flip their cards over, they're all put in order based on the kind of the chronological order. But the extremities are worth higher odds than the ones in the middle. So the the more wild you are with your guesses, the more money they're going to be worth because you don't actually just score points based on what you've bid or what you've put forward as, as your answer. You can actually bid on other players being right. So even if you're not good at trivia, you're not generally not good at this kind of thing, if you think somebody is onto the right thing and somebody knows the style of question that's been asked, you can invest in them knowing the answer, which is absolutely fantastic. Just a great twist in order to level the playing field in terms of general knowledge. And it just works extremely well. So simple mechanically, but such a novel concept that just works flawlessly. And because of that, and the higher player count, the you know the familiarity with that trivia style game, it just comes together really well. And um, as I said, it's never ever fallen flat for me. Everyone's always enjoyed this every single time. So at number nine, I have Wits and Wagers. Uh, at number eight, I have The Quacks of Quedlinburg. Now this is a, a monster hit from a couple of years ago now. It's a pushy luck style game and probably more, more of an actual board game rather than a, than a party game or anything like that. So at, at that family weight, I should say, you know, it's not terribly complex, but this one, you are basically taking the role of these different doctors, I suppose, um, trying to make this mad potion up, trying not to make it explode. Um, and the cool thing about this game is you have a bag of tokens and you're always blindly dipping into this bag, drawing one out and placing them on your cauldron, trying to get as high as you can up that track. Um, before the potion explodes because as soon as you draw out the I think it's the seventh white tile from that bag or up to a value of seven then your potion is going to explode and you're not going to get as many rewards as if it didn't explode because at the end of the round you're going to get points to determine on how far you get but you're also going to get currency in order to buy new tokens from your to your bag and those tokens aren't only going to let you go around faster or further around the track and kind of deplete the odds of you um, exploding your potion, but they also do lots of cool, weird and wonderful things such as boosting each other or letting you put tokens back in the bag and so on. 
So there's a lot of variability here. You can do lots of different setups. And I just think the crux of it is a lot of fun. And that pushy luck nature, I think, is generally uh, a, me a mechanism that goes down well with um, with anybody, really. I think anybody can enjoy that mechanism. Hence why the Quacks and Quedlinburg has always been uh, enjoyed by anybody I've played it with. Uh, next up, at number seven, I have Letter Jam. Now, Letter Jam is a game that I really love. This one is a cooperative, so a game where you're all working together, which is generally a good thing in terms of most people enjoying it, because I know a lot of people don't enjoy real competitiveness. But this one is a cooperative deduction game. And not only is it a cooperative deduction game, it's a cooperative deduction word game, as you are trying to work with each other, trying to help each other decipher a certain word that's been put in front of you at the start of the game. So you are always have a card uh, representing a letter from the word facing away from you so that all the other players can see it apart from yourself and then you are trying to build words using common letters and the letters from, from the other players in order to help them decipher what that letter can be. And at the end of the game they're, they're going to have a bunch of letters and they're going to try and mix them up to make an anagram to decipher what the original word was. It sounds a little bit complicated, but it's really not. It's always worked really well. And for a game that's, I suppose it's pretty dry in the face of it, because of the the, the room for the misinterpretation and things sneak into this game, it can actually create a lot of laughs and you can go so far off the rails with what you were, you know, intending that it just creates for a lot of fun moments. And, you know, you can really get those moments where you, you question what your, what your teammates are doing, but all in good spirits. And I think... There are some real familiar aspects here because if you like games like you know Scrabble, your your word games, most people like building words and stuff like that. And this one just does that really well with that extra layer of gaminess to keep more you know more experienced gamers entertained, but still being very accessible to newbies. So always love playing this game, and I've played this one quite a lot now with a lot of different people, and it's always gone down a treat. Even when I think original, sometimes at the beginning of the game, I think you know, I don't think they're going to like this very much. It always has done well, which is uh, a great thing. So uh, at number seven, I have Letter Jam. Uh, at number six, I have Karuba. A Karuba is a tile placement game where it's almost like a bingo style game as well, because every turn, every somebody's going to draw a tile, and that tile is going to have a certain um, depiction of roads on that tile. And the idea is you're placing these tiles onto the board, trying to link up a, uh, an adventurer to a matching temple of the same colour. And it's a real puzzly game as you're trying to map out these rows, trying to get these people to their, to their temples as efficiently as you can with as little wastage as you can. And it's a race, so whoever gets there faster gets the higher value tokens. Uh, you can pick up gems on the way as you travel. And it just has some really interesting decisions, extremely simple to explain, but at the same time, engaging probably well, one of the most engaging games next to no downtime as well um, there's no silly rules there's nothing like that and it's just the crux of it is where the fun lies and um, yeah everyone I played it with as the, as the, as the, uh, as the list would assume uh, has always enjoyed this one so a great game and um, really stood the test of time as well I played this one quite a few times and it's still really enjoyable. And the more people I introduce it to, um, you know, it's never fallen flat and it's always lived up to um, what I hope it would do. So at number six, I have Karuba. At number five, I have another pushy luck style game. This one is called Push. A push is a, a simple card game, but also with a, a big die. And you are basically, on your turn, you are drawing cards from a stack and placing them in different columns. And you have up to three columns to play with. And the idea is you're trying not to get any duplicate colours or duplicate numbers on any of those columns. Because as soon as you do, you're going to go bust and essentially waste your turn. But also when you when you go bust, you have to roll this die. And that die shows a certain colour, depending on which face it lands on. And you're going to have to lose every single colour that you've taken in. So, or every card of that colour that you've taken so far out of the game. So it has this real... Um, tension to it where you just can't afford to roll that dice and or the roll that die and if you do you can pay big time because in choose it or in place of taking a normal turn where as i said you draw those cards into the different columns you can choose to bank a certain color to keep it safe um, completely 
um, you're safe from being lost at all. So I do like that. That has that real cool decision of how far are you going to push? How far are you going to just keep taking turns and try not to bank anything and just hope you don't roll um, a certain colour? Because additionally, you can roll the black on the die and that will get rid of all your cards, which just really ramps up that tension of having to roll that die. And you could force other players to... Um, to have to roll the die as well, which is just extremely fun and a great interaction, but just real visceral tension and great fun um, for everything you do in this game. And it only plays in about 20 minutes as well, which is just fantastic. So a real fun one and has a real kind of mass market feel to it. And, it, and the way it does that, but still being, um, you know, good in terms of gamers as well, I think it's just fantastic. So push is number five. Uh, next up, I have Coloretto at number four. So Coloretto has some similarities to push, actually, as you are drawing different chameleons from the stack of card and playing them in different columns. Um, and the idea is that you either do that and draw, draw a card and put it on a column, or you can take a column of chameleons in order to score points. But you only score points for three different colours. And then if you ever end up acquiring more than those three different colours, you're going to end up taking them as negative points. And this just creates some really interesting pushy luck and some interesting player interaction as you can kind of lay up your opponents in order to make things incentivizing for them. Or when things do build up and they get a bit greedy and think, you know, I can get more out of this column, you can end up giving them a color that they really don't want to take. And, you know, the game, I think it accommodates uh, two to six players, I believe. So it has a nice wide player count here. And for every single player count you play it with, it works extremely well. Um, love it. It's just one of the most simple and elegant games, but one that just has a timeless and evergreen feel to it for me. Played this with so many players and always gone down a treat. Even with players who've never played a modern board game or a modern card game um, have really enjoyed this one. Colorado, an absolute treat and a delight of a game. Uh, at number three, I have a pure party game. This one is Just One. Now, Just One is probably the simplest party game I can think of. And another game where you are purely working together in a team. So I like that. I think I think cooperative games do a great job of inviting more people in. And this one, somebody is going to have a, word, a clue card that's going to have a number of words on them. And you're going to choose, choose a number associating to one of those words. And then everybody is going to try and give the person whose card it is a clue to help them decipher what that word is. But the trick this game is that you don't want to be too obvious because if two people end up, or two or more people end up writing the same clue, then those clues are going to be taken out of the equation. So you want to be accurate enough so that you can help the player guess what the word is correctly, but vague enough that other players aren't going to write the same clue as you. And that creates some really interesting decisions, some thinking outside of the box, and it's always funny because you try to end up being uh, a bit different and try to be a bit you know, vague with your answers and then somebody else writes, so ends up writing the same thing anyway and then you realise you should have written the obvious thing. So some real laugh out loud moments here. I love the low barrier to entry. Um, literally, you can explain this game in 30 seconds. You can, you can play this with young children. You can play it with the elderly. You know, Anybody who doesn't play games can play this game and um, this game's proven it for me personally. Everybody's enjoyed this one and um, just goes down a treat at, say, you know, parties at Christmas and things like that. It's just one of the go-to games for me now because it has never, ever let me down. That is just one at number three. Uh, at number two, I have uh, a game that I always talk about. This one is No Thanks. No Thanks is one of the games and my most trusted games that I always bring to a games night, um, especially when I'm play, playing with people I, I've never played before or I'm in introducing modern games to. This one is a game that takes about 15 minutes to play and you, the idea is you're trying to get as few points as possible. So it's one of those golfing style games where whoever gets the lowest score is going to win. And the game is broken down into two very simple decisions. So all you're gonna do is you're gonna draw a card out on display for all the players when it comes to you, you are either going to take that card as negative points, which is not, not a good thing, or you could put one of your tokens that you're allocated at the start of the game onto the card to pass on taking it, and then it'll go on to the next person. But the trick is that more and more of these tokens that are placed, placed onto this card creates a bigger incentive for the next person to take it, because every token that's placed on that card counts as a negative point, which is a good thing. And it also gives you more tokens to pass on future cards. So it has that real core decision of can I afford to take this tile or, or this card or can I not? 
And am I going to keep placing placing tokens on it and waste my tokens and potentially back myself into a corner next turn? Can I afford to keep passing or am I going to run out? And so on. And additionally, you can also try and create runs of cards because if you ever score a run of cards, only the lowest card of that run scores. Uh, which just adds another initial, just an interesting little twist in the game. It makes people think, oh, you yeah, know, that's cool. That's cool. I like that. And it's one of those games where you think initially, because the, the game isn't very flashy, it doesn't have any lavish components, no fancy artwork. But I love this game because when you end up teaching it, people just you just see the smile on people's faces and, and it, it, you just see the game clicking with them and they think, you know what, this is cool. I like this. This is great. So that's why uh, No Thanks is on this right at the top of this list. Um, because you know I played this with so many different people, and every single time um, we end up playing it at the start of the night, and at the end of the night we go, you know what, can we go back and play No Thanks? Because that one was really good fun. So No Thanks is number two, and finally at number one I have my most played game of all time. This one is For Sale. Now For Sale I must have played for maybe fifty or sixty times, and not once have I ever had a bad game of this. And for me, that is just the ultimate praise. So despite me having this game in my collection for years and years and years, in fact, it was one of the first games I ever bought, um, it's still not even, not the thought hasn't even crossed my mind of this leaving my collection. Um, I've taught this to brand new gamers. I still play this with really experienced gamers. And it's always great fun because the decisions in this game are still fantastic. Uh, the idea of the game is that we are supposed to be buying these different properties by bidding on them. You've got really poor quality properties, um, number number one, all the way up to really valuable and properties number thirty, and you are bidding a very limited pool of money to collect these um, properties. And the second half of the game, you are using those properties to blind bid in order to collect cash checks. And whoever's got the most money at the end of the game is going to be the winner. This game has some amazing player interaction as you're trying to get into the head of your opponent, trying to get the most value out of these cards, just trying to squeeze that next margin to get to the next um, the next level of check that, that's good for you. It's just fantastic. Some really simple mechanisms, um, but ones that just work well. And that, that core decision making in this game and the quality of it just makes this game just, just transcend time really. It's an instant classic. Um, said stood up to repeated plays with brand new gamers um, and yeah every time I've played this with somebody they've always thought you know what that is fantastic let's play that again or you know what I'm going to buy my own copy because my family would love this brilliant game um, and just a go-to for me and you know if I'm said so if I'm going to go to a party or something I'll always bring for sale and without question it is going to do well I've got no there's no room in my mind to think that this game is going to fall flat I've never had that concern and I can just put this on the table with confidence just knowing that everybody at the table is going to enjoy it no matter what kind of your experience is so for that reason for sale is at number one for me and you know what I don't think it was even in question this was going to be number one for me it's a game that I've never stopped talking highly about um, since I started you know this channel or um, started getting into into modern games because while it's yeah it's it might look a bit it might look a bit family oriented and a bit light to some gamers, but I wouldn't let that put you off it because the game itself is absolutely fantastic. And I think you're missing a trick if you can't get any enjoyment out of it because it is just that strong of a design. So I hope you've enjoyed this top 10 games or list of games that have never let me down. I think I think that is probably one of the highest levels of acclaim that you can give to a game, ones that you can just fully trust because the, the design is that tight and that enjoyable. So if you have enjoyed the video, please hit like and subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos too. For everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board.